we have a key. So all of this is really, uh, this final project is, uh, so I don't think that the ask here is tremendously much in the end of the day. So what I'm, what I'm expecting at the end of the class, which is essentially uh, in 24 days. So we still have three and a half weeks of time. So we still have a little bit of time, not that much, but we still have time. So I urge you really to kind of sit down, go through the data set, study the variables, go on the CDC website, as I suggest in the text, uh, study the variables, go through the data dictionary and really think about these variables. So I'm, I'm also I'm well aware that uh, you're, not, you're not from the medical field, you're not from the public health field, but these are generally uh, understandable parameters. There's quality of life in there, there's physical activity in there, there's body mass index in there, which, which are variables that we're all kind of comfortable with. And uh, from, 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 from just a general circumstance in life, we know a lot of these variables without having a medical background. So the idea here is really, to kind of go into the literature and this asks from you to kind of go back to whatever resource you want to use. I would recommend PubMed, for example, as I'm suggesting. So that's the National Library of Medicine where all papers that are being published basically are being published. So just go through to enhanced papers, which I've suggested in the past. Go through enhanced papers, look at analysis that were conducted in the past. Look in associations between body mass index, anthropometric measures, and physical activity, and just see what associations have been tested. And then just approach it in a, with a very simple mind, ask a very, very simple research question. And that could be as simple as like, are people that have a body mass index that is considered overweight above 25, do they have different blood pressures? Do they have a different level of physical activity? Do they have different cholesterol levels? Are they more likely to be a diabetic? We're doing today, we're doing chi squared tests. So this is how you would test that. So just ask simple questions that do have for you enough potential to write a little bit of a research paper with a little bit of background. I'm not asking it very much in, in depth in review of the topic, right? I want to see that you have really put some thought into this that you have studied the literature and that you have a, a clear idea what you want to analyze. Then uh, you all know introduction, you basically you introduce the idea, you introduce the data, you introduce your research question, and then you basically you end the introduction with a thesis statement in which you're clearly outlining your research question. Then in the methods part, you're basically outlining the methods that you use. So first you do a study design and selection, so you have all had uh, writing, scientific writing in some shape or form for, for your previous classes. And so it is my understanding and that's my assumption that you know how to write papers. So in the method section, you would basically would present how were the subjects selected. And this is where you have to go back to the CDC and kind of study the enhance. If you use different data sets, like the one that I've posted, then use the methods and the introduction that is outlined in this paper which is actually a very interesting randomized controlled trial that uh, both uh, me and uh, your professor and, and, and the class after this class uh, were both willing uh, to, to work with you, like multidisciplinary kind of like uh, set the stage in which you're basically learning about RCTs as well as about analytics, because analytically that's very challenging and very interesting. So, I think that is one wonderful uh, opportunity, but basically in the methods part, you're basically outlining, okay, so who were the participants? How were they selected? How were they studied? What were the measurements that were being used? And then the statistic analysis part basically outlines what methods did you use? So this is obviously where it's overarching into the analysis plan. And that's more the weight of this class because in the analysis plan, you're outlining, okay, so I'm doing for uh, I doing a stratification, I chose these subjects with complete data. These are being analyzed. I use these parameters. I stratify in these groups. I analyze and compare these groups. And then you use the respective methods that we're discussing in class. And then in the end of the day, the next three weeks, you just need to code what you said you would do. And with that coding, I will, uh, so Professor Khan already, so some of you have spoken. <laughs> and, and so there seems to be an, an idea that it would be good to have a review class. 
So I will host the review house at 3 p.m. on Saturday where we can go through specific questions. So I'm, I will post announcement on, uh, on Zoom. We're gonna do this as a virtual class where we can go through specific questions. So please all join, but join with specific questions. I'm not gonna do a review class where I go through all the material again. I wanna go through specific errors and problems that you encounter when you're coding and explain to you what the problem is. And I will allude to some of the problems that I have seen now uh, over the course of this class. And uh, so it's, it's minor things, right? The problem with our coding is minor things have ramifications. And these minor things, if you understand them, it's usually, it's just, it's a dollar sign there. It's, it's, it's an addition there. It's nothing terrible, but it's just, it, it, it requires a little bit of uh, more explanation and then, then it will be crystal clear. I'm convinced of that. So, but this is the methods part. Okay, so methods part in the end always is the statistical analysis part. Analysis part basically translates into the analysis, analysis plan, which we have the outline below here, outline. So it's basically uh, then going into more detail. The results part is something we're gonna do over the next three weeks. I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna come earlier to class that we can talk about whatever you put together. We can do again another review session if needed uh, on a weekend. So that's the results part. So that will come. But you see already to some extent in the slides, you have analysis presented to you with the various methods that we're presenting in class that you can basically utilize as an outline for your report. So you know already how this is going to look like. And you know from the papers that you're reviewing for the other class, for our CT class, you know how a table one looks like, what demographics are in there, you know, mean plus minus standard deviation, and this, this, this kind of general format, how you present data. So I don't anticipate there much problems. Uh, we will talk about correlational analysis, so model presentation, we can talk about this in more detail, but that's, let's keep this at bay for now. Good, and then you have discussion and conclusion, and then discussion and conclusion, you're basically, you're reviewing your results, you're reviewing your research question, you're stating what you found, then you discuss it with one or two other papers that you have found and presented in your introduction. And then you basically you outline strengths and limitations. And these are, we can talk about this moving forward. But that's basically the outline. And just, just follow this outline with, uh, with your, uh, how should I say, with the classes you put on and the classes that you employ, that magnifying class that you employ on the data set. So that's kind of the idea and the analysis plan. In there, I basically, I want to just see the study aims. What are you aiming to answer? What is the question that you're aiming to answer? How are you planning to do that? What are your null hypotheses? So an aim is different from a hypothesis, right? An aim is just an objective. Like this is the question I want to answer. This is what I want to analyze. And then in the hypothesis, you basically you take, so I'm interested whether there's an association between blood pressure and body mass index. And in another hypothesis, I basically would hammer out, I would say like, I'm stratifying my population in two groups in those that are overweight and those that are not overweight. My null hypothesis is, I hypothesize that there's no difference between those that are overweight and those that are not overweight in terms of blood pressure, in terms of physical activity, in terms of cholesterol. That is another hypothesis, right? Just as we discussed it in class. In the alternative hypothesis, I would then say, so I have another hypothesis, an alternative hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, there is a difference between those two groups. And then you have a primary and a secondary outcome, which is, cholesterol and body mass index, secondary outcome, physical activity and body mass index. Or body mass of the other way around, physical activity, low physical activity could cause a higher body mass index. So it's also kind of in which direction the association points can essentially be part of your hypothesis, of your research question. Are those that are moving less, have they higher uh, cholesterol levels? Are they that are less physically active have the higher body mass index? Do they have higher blood pressures? For example, right? Are they happier? I don't know. There's a long list of parameters available for you. Yep. You want to say the basis on what we are saying, what we are seeing. Exactly. Exactly. 
So what do, what do you plan to look at? That's what I want you to outline in an analysis plan. In the end of the day, so there's a reason, and maybe I haven't emphasized the reason for this analysis plan enough. When I started managing analysts, one thing that I came across was that analysts told me, I'm asked to analyze this. I don't know why I'm doing this. And I don't understand why, why I'm supposed to compare these two groups. So the idea here is really to kind of create a rationale. And, and I then uh, moved forward and uh, started filling out analysis plans, developing these analysis plans to make it tangible for an analyst. And this is that piece that I'm outlining in the syllabus. I think one of the take home messages, take home skill sets from this class is to facilitate the communication between different disciplines. There is an expert in trial design, there's a physician, there's a researcher, there's a biologist, there's an analyst, there are different people involved in the discussion of a research study. And I think tools that allow you to kind of allow them to speak to each other and communicate to them in, in a way that they understand each other, that is really key to conduct studies. Whatever that is, a retrospective study, a prospective study, you just got to find tools to get this knowledge across and to connect all the dots. And that's the idea of an analysis plan, because the analysis plan is something that will be super useful for you in whatever capacity you're going to be looking at trials to communicate to an analyst. That's my objective. That's my hypothesis. That's the tools that I think are good. Now give me the tools that you think are good. And that's the idea of an analysis plan. So report, analysis plan, and these two things that you today is, a, is yeah. Okay. <laughs> get, 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 the work go, get, no, get, get the work going and make sure you get something to me ASAP because we have three weeks left to get a final report, right? We're, we're in this together. Okay, so we want all of you have a good final report. The way to get there is by us all communicating, preferably in a discussion board setting in class, in radio session that I'm hosting on Saturday, and I will send an invite out. But there needs to be communication at this point. You need to dig the heels in to get this going. Okay? Does it make clear? <laughs> so you will see. There is a draft version on Canvas. Yeah. Our draft version. Your draft version, yeah. Well, as soon as you send me that, you, you're passing the ball in my court. Don't send me just a couple of bullet points, like really put, put thought work into this, how you want this to be. So now don't worry about the deadline today. Get it to me by the weekend. And let's, let's initiate this, this conversation ASAP, because time is running. The clock is ticking. But this final report is going to be the outcome, and that's that's the mainstay. That's the core piece of this class. So, this is the outline that I'm suggesting. Well, surprise me was different than the Bella outline. I'd, I'd be happy to look at it and discuss it with you. That worked for me. <laughs> so. It's it's kind of it's my standard. It's it's not it's not generated. You see this all in different formats, right? It's like a scientific paper follows a certain outline. That's kind of the standard, and that's usually dictated by journals. An analysis plan is usually an internal document, in most cases. It, yes, and 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 it was there was thought put into uh, such an outline. Uh, in the way, okay, so what information needs to be in there? Obviously, the background in an analysis plan doesn't have to be as long as a background, let's say, in, in a scientific paper, right? That's like bullet points. That's like four different, four sentences, five sentences. Hmm? I'm kind of confused with that. You get confused with that? Oh, okay. I hope we were able to remedy that confusion. No, but yes. Um, Once again, sorry. Oh, wow, nice. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, um, 
My primary study aim would be to study if there is a significant relationship between poverty and diabetes. Okay. And uh, my non hypothesis would be there is no relationship between poverty and diabetes. Correct. And the research hypothesis is there is a relationship. What is important with, uh, with so you basically you distinguish between exposure and outcome. So exposure in that sense would be poverty and outcome would be diabetes. So diabetes is easy, right? The definition of diabetes is considerably easy because there's a variable in there that says diabetes, yes, no. Okay, so that's, that's a no-brainer, right? <laughs> Exposure gets a little bit more tricky. Exposure gets a little bit more tricky because you need to make sure that in the analysis plan you're outlining, and this is part of that discussion that we need to have, because you need to define that exposure. So definition of variables is extremely important too. Uh, so that is that is also already a little bit of uh, thought work that that you need to do to define poverty. But it, it, it's an interesting question. Love the question. Mm -hmm. So, which household income are you going to choose as poverty? And there is a very key variable also. Yeah. Okay, no, but how do you define poverty? It's like if, look, it's like if, if you have somewhat, don't do the same topic, do a different topic, but you, you can, you can kind of, you can interact if you say, okay, so you're, you're, you're you want to team up and you want to do comparable outcomes and you want to do the comparable uh, settings, that's fine with me. Don't do the same outcome, just pick something different, but you can, you can team up and you can use corresponding definitions, for example. But with definition of outcome, and this is a discussion point, right? Because household income, I don't even know what's the poverty level in the US. Exactly. And the poverty statistic in the table is a ratio of property lines, but that, like, it's similar to. Excellent. Getting goosebumps. Half the discussion already written. Perfect. Love it. <laughs> okay. No, but this is exactly this is this this is these are things we've been exposed to, right? I'm not asking you to write a, a paper about the biology of, of sync metabolism in the body. I'm, 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 I'm just take a topic that is interesting. And this is why I love the enhanced data so much because it really allows you to understand the US population. That's why I'm such a big fan of that study. And that's, that's really the idea is like, ask yourself questions from your day-to-day -day life and ask the data the question. Today we're talking about the social political topic. So it's, 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 you have the possibility here to really ask the data a question that you may have asked yourself in the setting of a conversation, for example, and, and now you have data in front of you that corresponds and represents the US population and you can actually really ask this question. So it's actually what I'm asking is actually something intellectually very stimulating. Yes. Like in my own case, hmm? in my in my case, yeah. I'm looking at the attention line. Okay. Which has to do with two parameters in that first step, which is the historical data. Okay. For sure. And I'm going to be comparing it with other data, the working and the non working picture also. Yeah. Because some um, offices they have um, wellness programs for people that work with them. Okay. But I don't see that how that how it correlates or who does any benefits. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're not working, you tend to have some different directly paths because you can be telling time. And again, I want to compare it with also the the sleep, the light sleep hour. Okay. I saw it from that hour as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we can. We can. We can uh, definitely hammer it. Write it down and analysis plan exactly what you're intending to do, 
and then let's commence the conversation about the topic. It's it's a loaded topic. I'm I'm just warning you. So there's a lot of considerations in there, but it's it's an exciting topic. It's an exciting topic, definitely. So, okay. So does that put a little bit of ease on the topic now? I'm just I don't want you to be overly concerned. So it's 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 not an easy task, but it's it's a fun task. All right. Any questions on Zoom? She, Vivek, Talia. So I hope you still can hear me. Um, so if there are no current questions on, on Zoom, please email me whatever you uh, produce. Try to meet the deadline with tonight, but definitely get something to me by the weekend. Uh, I will be hosting this review session at 3 p.m. on Saturday. Um, uh, we can talk about analysis plan. It's like I, I, I work my afternoon free. And let's let's have a conversation about where we're gonna go with this. And we can do this repeatedly. I just wanna make sure that you have a good um, progress here with things. Okay. If no further question, then let's let's do a little bit of uh, theory. Yes. Is is what? Our last piece. Our last piece. Well, the time it needs to be enough because that's all we got. I need to submit grades. Uh, I think it's two days after our last class. So. Yes. Uh, okay, one at a time. Okay. Well, I I can't I can't change the timeline. So, and uh, it's like. I'm just we are just trying to give you some feedback about it because. Oh, the cool. I think I will make it clear about all. Yeah. So what I will do with the quiz. Uh, and and I have started doing that already with quiz one. It's like so. What I need to do in my capacity here, I need to grade you, right? So I'm gonna take all these results and I'm gonna map this out. I look at the distribution and then I see the distribution and I'm gonna shift the distribution until the first colleagues are hitting the maximum level. So all of you are gonna shift upwards, following uh, the best in class because essentially I, I, I want to have an, a fair distribution right so i'm again i'm not after your gpa i just need to motivate you to really uh, follow along so well, upon upon reviewing upon reviewing the quiz, uh, I don't think that necessarily the questions are really that complicated. So we can go through the question. This was it was either a one liner in R or it was maybe like two cells in Excel. So it's not. <laughs> I was not necessarily happy to see the outcomes. Yeah, I know you you had technical problems even. So it's it, it's it's just it's it's all complicated. I, I understand that, but we will find we we'll find a fair and even outcome to this. Okay, so don't yeah. Uh, yeah. They're all fine. Don't don't stress too much about it. Okay, good. Um, but things should challenge you, right? It should be a challenge. Shouldn't be a stroll in the park. Okay. Okay, any further questions? If not, then let's get started. So we have we have a couple of material to get through, uh, and we have now only an hour and a half left. Um, all right, we are talking today about introduction to population-based research and study design two. So that's the second level of that, and we are discussing today the only non-parametric test. Again, as a recap, there are parametric tests and non-parametric tests. Uh, parametric tests do make an assumption. So independent observations. Uh, ho uh, homoscedasticity and, and comparable distribution, and they also assume there's a normal distribution for parametric tests. Non-parametric tests do not make assumptions about distributions, which we're not going to go too deep into what that essentially all entails. We're going to do only one test today, which is the chi-squared test. The chi-squared test is important because it basically it compares frequency counts. 
And that is quite important. That's also important when it comes to uh, your final project, because you may want to compare frequency counts in groups that you have stratified. So we will today talk about the so-called chi-squared test. And then we're gonna talk about relative risk and odds ratios. Uh, relative risk and odds ratios is quite frequently found also in the context of uh, disease diagnostics um, and risk factor determination. Because essentially, if you have two groups, you have a certain risk in a certain group and building a ratio of these two risks, as we will do today, will basically give you an idea how does one group's risk relate to the risk of the other group. Relative risk is one way to approach this. The second way is the odds ratio, and we will, just, uh, we will calculate both. You have an Excel spreadsheet today on your, uh, on your canvas that basically uh, accompanies this class and the data we will be looking at today and uh, allows you to evaluate how to calculate both relative risk and odds ratios. Odds ratios you will also hear in the context of logistic regression, which is basically a, a probabilistic model allowing you to estimate the odds of an event occurring or not occurring in a population. You will have, uh, we will do linear regression, univariate linear regression next class. Then in two classes, we're gonna do multivariable linear regression. We will not get to logistic regression because of time. Uh, but I will post uh, a video from a previous class, or maybe I'm going to record a new one. I'm not sure yet. Depends on my schedule in the coming weeks. Um, where basically I'm showing you slides on logistic regression that basically allows you to uh, follow along and review logistic regression as well. And I will also post the slides. Um, okay. So we have a motivating example today, which is. Uh, a publication from the 1990s, basically with the question, is there evidence of discrimination uh, in death penalty verdicts? Basically comparing death penalty verdicts and uh, testing for an association with the race of the defendant. So that's uh, a topic that was investigated first in the 1990s, and that's actually uh, in, uh, got published in the law journal. So we're basically what we're seeing, we're seeing here in the columns, we're seeing death penalty verdict, yes or no. We're seeing race of the defendant as being either white or black in the rows. We're coming to a total here on uh, in the third column. And this is basically the marginal total for the columns. So the question asked here, and that's the question this publication asked was, is there evidence for discrimination in the verdict of death penalty? So probabilistically, you would look at this so as, is death penalty verdict independent of the race of the defendant? So that's the question asked here. So you would essentially pose an hypothesis where the death penalty verdict and the race of the defendant are independent. So that's basically where there's no association and you basically you see this independent. In an alternative hypothesis, you basically you ask the question that there is an association. So equivalently, you would basically pose it as a um, probability um, basically being the same for both race categories studied. Whereas for the alternative hypothesis, it's unequal for both. So, you would basically have different ways to approach this. You can approach it with uh, proportions, as we have done already, quantifying the proportions, doing a normal approximation, and comparing the proportions in these respective groups. That's one way to do that. But basically, there is uh, another approach to do that, and that's the chi squared test. And uh, so you basically, you are building now a so-called frequency table. So we have seen here the two by two frequency table or contingency table. What you're doing now for a chi-squared, you're basically populating this table 
utilizing the marginal totals, so the sum of columns and rows, and you're estimating an expected count in each of these cells if there were no association. Does it make sense? So you basically, you have the marginal totals. You keep those fixed. So these marginal totals here on the side, these marginal totals, you basically keep the same, but you're basically allocating now within these four cells that constitute the actual distribution in those four categories. You're basically now uh, estimating what this distribution would have needed to look like that there was no difference and no association between uh, the dependent and the independent variable on the, uh, in the rows. So basically the way you're doing that is so you have a probability of white and yes, death penalty verdict. And that is basically the probability of being white and the probability of having a death penalty verdict. So in essence, how the way you're calculating is the 4,909, multiplied by 364 divided by 10,068, which is the entire total of all entries. That's how you would approach this. And for that reason, I have attached here now an Excel spreadsheet because it's a little easier when you actually do this calculation yourself. So this is the same spreadsheet, that's the same data. And the way you're looking at this cell, this is basically now the product of your uh, probability of uh, that total of uh, white, that's penalty, yes, divided by the overall sum of all entries. So this gives you 177.5 individuals. That's the expected count if this is equally balanced between all four categories. So you categorize all the entries that you have, all the verdicts that have been spoken over the period of, what was it, 15 years in Florida. So you basically, you take this, the entries of 15 years and you're basically allocating it equally between all the four categories according to the marginal totals. So this is 177.5. Now what you need to do, and that's the beauty of having such an expected count, because the only thing you need to do now is to calculate the difference or you calculate it again. But this, uh, it's easier to actually look at it by uh, taking the difference between 4,909 as the total minus the 177, because that needs to add up to this number. So basically all you need to do if you do such an expected table, you need to determine one cell in a two by two table. Once you have that one cell, you can calculate the other one arithmetically. arithmetically. So, here the 177 and the one, uh, 186 add up to 364, the 177 and the 4731 add up to 4909, and that's just the leftover uh, subtracting all these three cells from the 10,068. So this is basically how you get your expected count. So now when you have an expected count, you basically you want to compare this expected count to what you actually observed. And that's where you're basically getting now to a chi-squared. So now you have an expected count that fills out these three cells. You have all four cells filled. And now you're basically doing the chi-squared calculation. And all the chi-squared is doing is, so you have observed and you have expected. It basically calculates the difference between observed and expected, squares it and divides it by expected. And now take a step back. You remember the calculation of a standard deviation? You basically, you have a standard deviation where you basically calculate the deviations from the mean. So you basically you're assuming the expected is your, now your reference level. You calculate the uh, deviation from that expected count. You standardize it to your actual expected count. You square it because it has a, a, a direction involved. You, so you, you, you're squaring it, you're dividing it by your expected count, and then you sum each individual cell's value up. And that gives you chi-squared. 
And that chi-squared is then, in the end of the day, compared against the unimodally positively skewed distribution. And just like the ANOVA, you, re you remember on the ANOVA, we had the F distribution, right? Unimodally positively skewed. As soon as it exceeds a certain critical value and, and drops in the critical region, you're rejecting the null hypothesis that there's more of a difference in that ratio between between groups and within groups variants. The same we're doing with the chi-square. As soon as this variability from the expected counts is deviating more than what we expect to be still comparable, and it's significantly different, as soon as it uh, exceeds this critical value, we are rejecting the null hypothesis and we are basically interpreting and drawing the inference that this is significantly different from our null hypothesis that there's no association. You do for a two by two table, you also do something that is called the Yates correction. The Yates correction, you're basically, you're adjusting it and you're, you're manipulating, uh, uh, manipulating, you're kind of adjusting because of the uh, smaller cell count, you're adjusting uh, your difference downwards and you get a more conservative estimate of your chi-square. So you're less likely to see a significant difference because if it's smaller, you're less likely. The more columns you have, uh, the more robust your estimate becomes because you have more data entries for each respective difference. So uh, the degrees of freedom here basically follow uh, a distribution of a row minus one and column minus one. You multiply those two. So the degree of freedom for a two by two table is one, which emphasizes already what I said before. That's why it's important to have a more conservative estimate, essentially. Good. So that's the chi-square table that basically allows you to give you those critical values on your unimodal positively skewed distribution. So you basically you see here the degrees of freedom, you see the upper tail areas and you see the respective 5% that you're basically uh, using as your critical value threshold. Chi-square tables are always one-tailed, just like the F-score table and the F distribution. Okay, if rows and columns are independent the observed and the expected shouldn't be very different logically, then the chi-square will be smaller, right? So if observed and expected are close to each other, don't create much difference. The standardized difference summed up to the chi-squared value will not be larger. So if there is an association between rows and columns, the observed are likely deviate from the expected counts. That's again when you get a larger uh, chi-squared value. You reject the null hypothesis if the chi-squared is exceeding your critical value. The alternatively, the alternative uh, hypothesis is naturally because the observed count can be higher, it can be lower. It's a two-sided hypothesis doesn't affect your interpretation in terms of the chi-squared threshold, that is one-sided because you're basically you're squaring it, thereby your chi-squared will always be positive. So the higher, the more likely it is correct to reject it. Good, the assumptions are that each observation is independent. That's kind of a logical, uh, logical assumption. So it's each of these entries needs to be an individual verdict. It cannot be a double entry. The sample is representative of the population. That's always kind of what we need to assume. Uh, the sample size should be considerably small. So you shouldn't have null entries. Then a chi-squared is not a really good test. Then you would usually, you would kind of at least add 0.5 or you would kind of try to, uh, so there are methods how you would deal with that in the end of the day, if there's a null entry. And no more than one fifth of the cells should have an expected count less than five. For small samples, you would use an exact binomial test rather than a chi squared. So it really should be a considerably large sample size. Uh, no assumptions about the distribution are required. And this is where it becomes a non parametric test because it doesn't require any uh, distribution as an assumption. 
so the observed counts that we've seen. So we basically were ending with a chi-squared statistic. So if you are now subtracting this from this, and you so remember the way we're calculating this. Um, I thought I had the calculation here too. I do not. So the calculation is done by basically literally like calculating observed minus expected squared divided by expected. So we get this from here, here and here, and it should be, yeah. So this would be the calculation how you would do the chi-squared. So you basically, you are now uh, summing this up. This should literally get you the chi-squared. That should be 39. And 3907. So that's a chi squared that is significantly different. So the p value from the chi squared test is uh, significant. So, what does that mean? That there is an association in our research question, right? And now we're getting actually further. So, now we're, we're getting into uh, comparing the individual risks. So now if we're looking at the actual proportion of death penalty verdict amongst white defendants, it's basically 4.8%. If we're comparing it to black defendants, it's 2.5%. That means that essentially white defendants are more likely to get a death penalty verdict. So the question now is, and this is, this is always important to keep in mind for the analysis of your final report, because at the end of the day, what you're looking at, you're looking at interactions. So not everything, not every association that you're basically taking into account now is really something that you can easily uh, accept as being and true association, that's the problem with retrospective research. So you basically, you're bound to associations and you're bound to actually analyze data that uh, you don't know to what extent this actually is a true association, whether there's actually causality involved. So you basically, you have now, um, and this is not a risk. So risk is being calculated as the individual entry you're interested in, and this is, Death penalty verdict, yes, amongst white defendants divided by the overall, the marginal total for white defendants overall, irrespective of the outcome. So this risk is here 4.8%. The corresponding risk of not getting a death penalty verdict is basically one minus that risk. So that's the inverse. So either you get a death penalty or you don't get a death penalty. So there are only those two outcomes, right? So if you have 4.8 for yes, uh, you can calculate one minus 4.8 or 100 minus 4.8 basically as being probability of having no. If you have now for the uh, black defendants, you have your 128 divided by 5159. Uh, you basically, you get a risk of 2.5%. So if you calculate now a relative risk, you would basically divide the risk in group one over risk in group two. And you basically you get here a relative risk of 1.94. So that indicates that there's a two point higher risk to get the death penalty when you're a white defendant. So, Odds, so the difference between odds is basically, you know, when you roll a die, you basically you have a probability of rolling a die, which is one over six. The probability uh, is inherently different because it sums up to a probability of 100%. Odds are different. Odds are basically transformed in a way that you would uh, have the outcome over the probability of not having the outcome. So basically you have a ratio between either there's an outcome or there's no outcome, whereas the probability sums up 
as the sum of all possible outcomes, and it basically sums up to 100%. Whereas odds are basically uh, determined differently because odds would be calculated as one rolling a, one, uh, rolling a six. So this would be one over five times the outcome of not rolling a six. So it would be one over five. So you're basically transforming it that it doesn't add up anymore to 100%, but it basically it gives you an estimate of the odds. It's just a different way to look at it. And it basically it is calculated as the probability of an outcome, P, divided by the probability of not having the outcomes, one minus P. So this is that calculation here. So you have P divided by one minus P, divided by P, one <laughs> divided by one minus p. So basically, this is the odds ratio, where you're basically uh, looking at this in a different angle. The interpretation is different. So the odds ratio is calculated here, where you basically you have. Uh, no. Oh yeah, yeah. So this is um, the relative risk is this over this. Whereas the odds ratio is probability divided by one minus probability divided by probability over one minus probability. So this is the difference between odds ratio and the risk ratio. One is just taking the ratio between two risks, whereas the odds ratio basically changes the lens. If uh, there's a very large sample size, you can basically uh, Used them quite in the, in, interchangeably. Um, okay, why am I showing you this? Because this is the way how you would interpret this. Because basically, what you see when it comes to risk or odds, you basically, if both odds or risk are one, you can assume that both groups are basically identical in terms of risk or odds, respectively. If, and this, this now determines what is your numerator and what is your denominator. So if you calculate risk of white over risk of black, you basically you're making uh, white your numerator, black your denominator. The denominator is now essentially your referent value. So if the, uh, the risk ratio is higher than one, the risk is higher for the group that is in the numerator. If the risk is lower than one, the risk in the numerator is lower than in the denominator. So it acts as a referent group, so to say. And the same with odds ratios. So you're basically expressing now the, the number of times the risk in the group of the, of the numerator is greater than that of the denominator. That would be the formal explanation and uh, interpretation. Make sense? Any questions? Yes. I think it's quite quite large again, and it really determines uh, the, the denominator that you're choosing in the way you're interpreting then risk and odds ratio. So now, okay, so we have talked about this. So this uh, odds and risk ratios always are restricted to two by two tables. So you essentially you always need to uh, categorize groups. Uh, if you have a three by two table or you have a table with more cells, you basically you would need to define it in a way that it is still being restricted to a two by two table. Otherwise you couldn't do an odds ratio because a ratio only indicates it as one numerator and one denominator. So then you need to rearrange your definitions. Good. Um, yeah, think about the lottery. If the risk of winning is one over one million, then the odds of winning are basically one over 999, no, it's actually one over one billion. So it's one over 999. No, it's nine, uh, no, one million. Uh, one over 999,999. So it's basically P over one minus P, right? 
So odds ratio are very commonly found. Uh, to come back to that example from the law journal, uh, so they basically, they went then further and this is now the example of interactions because they basically postulated there, were, there was more to that because uh, they didn't think of a reason that white defendants would more likely get a death penalty. So they basically dug deeper into this topic and they basically would now uh, stratify and take into account interactions between not only race of the suspect, but also race of the victim. So they basically found an interaction between um, these variables and they basically came up once you basically stratify them as per the victim's race, you basically were uh, on a whole different uh, chi-square distribution and you basically ended up with finding a protective effect of being white. So uh, I, I don't want to go too deep into now, but basically what they find that they, what they found out basically was uh, a non confusion statement where they basically they had uh, an association between death penalty verdict and race of victim that was actually stronger than race of defendant. But they also state that they can't make a causal conclusion on the topic. And it's also nothing that we should be discussing in this class. But basically it, it emphasizes that there's a statistical interaction that was not being paid attention to when doing the initial analysis. So you basically, you always need to take into account unknown unknowns and unknown interactions that you're not accounting for in your analysis. And that's the take home message really for the, uh, no, in, in, in for this particular class for your final project, because you may be seeing interactions between, or, or you may be seeing differences. Let's say I brought the example before, BMI and, and physical activity. But you don't know what was first. You don't know whether there was a lack of physical, uh, in, uh, physical activity due to disease, for example. And that basically resulted then in an increase in body mass index or, what, or whether there was the alternative hypothesis that basically a higher BMI basically resulted into not being physically active. So you don't know what was first. And that's to some extent also an, example of uh, effect modification and interaction. And that's the problem with the chi squared test because it doesn't inform on uh, causal associations, neither does it uh, inform on chronological dependence of variables. So, so it doesn't inform us of the departure of independence. It also doesn't give a real insight into the direction of this association. So chi-squared is actually very agnostic in which direction this uh, association actually points. And this is where you basically you need a quantification of risk and odds. And this is basically, quote unquote, you could almost label it as a post hoc test of a chi-squared test that you quantify uh, risks in the respective groups and uh, the risk ratios. Any questions on chi-squared? I think it's quite logical, right? It's like you're, you're populating a table and you're basically, you're, you're, you're quantifying an observed count from an expected count utilizing principles of determining probability for each of these cells of your table. And you're basically distributing these and comparing those differences between observed and expected. And based on that, you're basically determining whether this deviation is actually so strong that you would assume that there's an association between those two variables that exceeds something that would be acceptable under our hypothesis. Okay. So this was the chi-square test. Non-parametric test allows the comparison of uh, counts in a contingency table, allows in a post hoc setting then to determine risk in respective groups that you determine, and uh, basically is, is non-informative in terms of the direction between the groups and can then be followed up with risk determination and calculation of risk ratios. Related tests to a chi-squared 
is here a McNamara's test, which is basically a test that we would use for paired samples. We're not doing the McNamara's, but it's basically, it's, you gotta think of it in a way with two independent contingency tables. Taking into account that one basically is chronologically associated with the second one. Then you have an exact binomial test. Uh, I think I have the code in the, um, in the practice lab where we can look at this. Fisher's exact test, and that's an interesting one. So that's Lady Butterworth, I think was her name. So Fisher came up, <laughs> so that's, that's a fun, fun example. So Fisher is the same statistician that also uh, determined the 5% p-value as being the threshold for significance or not. So that's the level of significance. So yeah, I think he coined it sometimes in the 60s. So he actually did the well of Fisher's exact test. And this is where statisticians kind of disagree with public health and uh, medical researchers, because in a medical community, Fisher's exact is actually a fairly popular test. It's like a lot of papers will actually show you Fisher's exact. It's actually, uh, <laughs> I've heard a very strong opinion of a statistician who said like, you should use that because the Fisher's exact test basically allows uh, for a determination of the association. But the trick and the problem is that the marginal totals are fixed. That means that there is no deviation between the groups like we have seen in our two by two table where we had uh, the respective counts basically needed to add, be added up. Fisher actually always has like an equal distribution of these marginal totals and they're fixed by design. And the reason how Fisher came up with this test and that's, I think it was an afternoon tea party in somewhere in the UK. So who of you likes tea? Do you drink it with milk? Yes? Okay. So do you put your milk before the tea or do you put it after you put the tea? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. I like tea taking inside. <laughs> yeah? All together and then boil it. Oh, with the milk. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Okay, I have never heard that. Yes, you, you really? Okay, okay, that's cool. I didn't know that. Okay, good. I learned something. <laughs> but in principle, if you have a cup of tea, would you put the milk first or would you put it after? Um, but we don't use this. Like, we don't use milk with tea. No? Okay. Usually, I have tea like after. After. Okay. So. Yeah, everybody's nodding, okay, after. So there's actually, there seems to be an ongoing discussion whether you put it before or after, uh, because apparently if you put it after, it affects the taste. So I'm not a big tea drinker. I drink obscene amounts of coffee, but <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about tea. Um, I drink it without milk, notably. Okay, so there was Lady Butterworth was her name, at least as far as I record the story. So she claimed that uh, she could taste whether the milk was poured into the cup before the tea or after. And yeah. Fisher, oh wow, well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, you, you think you will taste that? Wow. Okay, so again, okay. next time I'm gonna bring tea and I'm gonna bring this to the test, we're gonna do Fisher's exact test. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> we got to speak about this after class. I want to learn more about this. Okay, good. Okay, so you have basically you have ten cups of tea, and you have five cups where you pour the milk before, and you have five cups where you pour the milk after. Fixed marginal totals. It's ten cups, right? And so she basically she correctly. So the the null hypothesis would be that she correctly identifies all ten. If there's indeed, if she indeed can taste it. No, actually, alternative hypothesis and under null hypothesis, yes, uh, no, it's true. Under the null hypothesis, it would be equally distributed between the groups. So obviously, that would be the null hypothesis. So there's no association under the null hypothesis. If this would, okay, 
and that the null hypothesis there would be an association that would actually be seen then in the distribution, but fixed marginal totals. So it is debatable and I, I kind of, I understand the argument of the statistician who taught me that like you shouldn't use a Fisher's exact, you should use a chi-squared because of those fixed marginal totals. In a medical community, I've, uh, I've read suggestions that if you have a small sample size, you, you are actually making a more accurate determination of that association if you use a Fisher's exact rather than a chi-squared. And chi-squared you only use with large sample sizes, which was also something that Professor Wardlin had in the slides that large sample size is actually something which makes the chi-squared the more suitable test. Okay, milk and tea. All right, good. So, but this again emphasizes how ubiquitous statistic can be, right? It's like you can, you can, uh, and that's the beauty of it. You can, with numbers and uh, statistic testing, you can ask so many different questions and you can shed light on so many different use cases, no matter what it is. If it's law review data, if it's public health data, if it's medical data, if it's consumer behavior on Amazon, these are all statistical methods that are being brought to use and to test. It's like what you, for example, what you know under machine learning and artificial intelligence, the underlying, uh, the underlying uh, algorithms are basically methods that we are touching on in the course of this class. A lot is logistic regression, basically just quantifying probabilities. Logistic regression with odds ratios is what we just discussed. Right? Okay, so we're basically, today we tested between the independence between two variables that basically included the count of this categorization. We basically, we uh, associated two variables with each other. We basically, we, we used chi-squared distribution to come to uh, either rejection or acceptance of a null hypothesis, which was the association between those two variables. Type one and type two error is basically here also the same, the type two error, keep in mind, you have a unimodal positively skewed distribution. You have a critical value, you have a critical region. The, the, your actual chi-square falls into this critical region. Your leftover area under that curve, under that tail, that is your type one error. And the type two error is you failing to reject your null hypothesis because you didn't meet your assumptions and you didn't have a large enough sample size, for example. Okay, that's all on theory that I had for today. It was a rather short one, although we have, uh, we have 40 minutes left. Any questions on any of this? All right, good. Uh, then today we're gonna do practice lab eight. So please also uh, study this uh, Excel spreadsheet. I think the, the calculations are kind of helpful to kind of really drill a little deep into what chi square essentially is. Uh, and they may be helpful for further educations. Good. Um, okay, so practice lab eight today. We have today, with practice lab eight, created lab three, which is kind of very strongly connected with practice lab eight. You follow along, understand practice lab eight, you got created lab three pretty much in the books. So I, I kind of redesigned the created labs, by the way. So uh, I made it a little bit more digestible for you guys. Discussion topic eight was posted. You're gonna learn a lot about the risk of bear attacks, uh, if I recall correctly. And then you have a first draft of analysis plans and the final reports. Uh, again, I'm, I made this a bit more of a softer deadline, but please get it to me, let's say Sunday at midnight, the latest, I really wanna have those. So you have to wake into work on this, it becomes that. And we can speak on Saturday about potential questions you may have. Good. Uh, any questions on any of these assignments? If not, then we can focus on, on practice lab eight. So practice lab eight. OK. 
Okay, so I am recording, good. Okay, practice lab eight is basically to some extent also going hand in hand with uh, what we did in earlier labs. Uh, some of you already used chi-squared as I have seen uh, in some submissions. So first of all, we first need our NHANE subset. So this should be on uh, Canvas for today's module. So, get there. Yeah. so there is Enhance uh, Module 8 Enhance subset. Please download it to your folder. Just quickly again, if you want to access this. So I'm on a Mac. You click on this, uh, you make a right click, you press uh, the option key. It will automatically copy the path name for you. In Windows, it's a little bit more tricky. You basically, you need to go on properties, uh, select and copy the location, and then separately copy the path name, and then replace all slashes with backslashes. No, wrong, or you need to replace all backslashes that are basically tilted to the left. You need to replace them with slashes that are tilted to the right. That's a little bit annoying, I'm well aware, but that's unfortunately what we need to do because uh, R is Linux based, whereas Windows uh, maintains using backslashes, which is a peculiarity of Windows. Good. Um, okay, once we have done that, we can basically run line two. Line two is basically uh, the same read.csv as we have used it in the past which is super simple to run. And we're basically, we're reading our data file and we're getting our data frame. The data frame is a data frame that you have seen already. It's basically consistent with practice lab seven, I believe. You can always look and I'm flagging this and I hope you, uh, I think I talked about this already before. If you just wanna have a quick look at your data set, which I highly recommend to all of you, just inspect your data set. So firstly, you can do always STR. So STRDF gets you the respective variables. You can inspect them, you can look at them and you kind of get a feeling already what type of variable this is. You can uh, also look at it in a more Excel-centric spreadsheet by basically clicking here on that uh, tab, uh, table spreadsheet, uh, that, that spreadsheet-like symbol here on the right, all the way up here. That's how you basically get to this overview. If you just want to quickly do this in your console, you can also look at this as head df. Head will basically just give you the first six, will just give you the first six entry and show you in a more Excel spreadsheet like appearance, just shows you a quick overview of how the data looks, looks like. If you're interested in the last six entries, it's head or tails. So you do tail DF, you get the last six entries. It's, it's nice to have because you kind of, you get, a, you get a bit of a feel for the data. It's really a lot in R. And this is what I've noticed in submissions that I've seen over the week. A lot is inspection and reflection on what data you actually have at hand. One thing that I, for, for example, say, uh, saw was you always need to uh, distinguish between objects and variables in your object. If you have an object, which is here DF, for example, that's the data frame, that's the actual object. If you want to create or address a variable in your object, you need to first state the object name, make a dollar sign and indicate to R that now I want that object and I wanna have something from that object, which is the variable SPP. So that's DF dollar SPP gets you only the variable SPP from the dollar, uh, from the DF uh, data frame. Okay. 
so please, I, I highly recommend when you when you are coding, reutilize a lot of the code. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm trying to like intentionally uh, create a lot of code for you that you can really utilize uh, for your final project. So uh, line four, basically loading the dplyr library, good library to always have loaded. In our specific case here is particularly important because we need the so-called n-tile function. n-tile basically is stratifying now uh, the entire data set into two tiles in an additional variable. Pay attention here to this additional variable, and I'm saying this uh, in line with what I said before, this additional uh, variable that I'm creating here is indicated to be part of the DF data set. So I'm saying create a new variable. That is everything before the equal sign, the, high, the smaller, sign, uh, smaller hyphen sign. DF dollar SPP turtles. That is telling our create a new variable and pack into that variable whatever I tell you after the equal sign. And what I'm telling our to do with that stuff after the equals and is entire df spp3 so entire is basically creating these turtle quartiles quintiles sextiles septiles octiles whatever uh, tiles i'm going to show it at. here i see three that's basically turtles if i make a four it's quartiles if i make a it five it's quintiles but i'm telling r Take df dollar spp, take the spp variable in my data frame, stratify it in three equal parts, and pack that stratification variable as a nominal variable or as an ordinal variable into df dollar spp turtles. That's what I'm telling R in line five. And it does that for me. And here on line six, I basically tell R, so look, okay, so I can, thank you for creating DF SPP turtles. Now I want to make DF SPP turtles factor that basically factor, uh, creates factors for DF SPP turtles. Since it's turtles, it has three different levels. So levels equals concatenate. It's just a little filler. It kind of it, it fills the gaps for R and it tells R, look, there's now more than just one value coming. So it's basically one, two, three, one, two, three. Yes. Sorry? You have an error message. Where? Line five. Line five. Then you didn't load line two correctly. That would be my first. Do you have a DF? With thousand entries, what are the variables that have in DF? Do an LSDF, LS parenthesis. SPP? SPP? SPP. And your line five looks exactly like this. I'm almost, I almost guarantee you there's a typo somewhere in there. And that's, that's the trick, but R is unforgiving. So R does not forgive typos. This comes back, right? Yeah. This is like five. Okay, can you do LS? Oh, that's, look, uh, it, if it does that. Yeah. There's an error in there. There's an error in there? Yeah. Oh, that's that's what. Oh, wait, 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 wait. This is where it starts. Oh, OK. So, OK. So you did STR. You had STR before. That's why it didn't work, because it didn't find the data frame. 
So Factor is now creating DFSPP turtles, recognizes what you're telling it, that it has three levels, levels one, two, and three. And it literally it is, if you do C, one column three, this is basically what you're telling R. You're telling R here nothing else, but it's, I have level one, I have level two, I have level three. That's levels. If I have labels, I'm just saying, so look, okay, so I have one, two, and three, and I want to label these three levels with turtle one, turtle two, turtle three. That's labels. And creating this factor, and this is why I like creating these factors, because it basically allows for you now, R will automatically now recognize this. These as different factors and the summary, uh, basically it will automatically start counting it. So basically they're equally sized. That's basically giving you an idea of how that looks like. If I want to know now what my factors look like in terms of the distribution within those groups, I can run line nine that uh, opens the Dubai library, which we have discussed and used already. And summary by is just, it's not the most, it's an older of the functions. So Dubai has gone through a couple of iterations in the, in, 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 the, in the meanwhile, but summary by basically creates now summary uh, calculation for SPP and H. So it basically it says, this is the dependent variable. I'm interested in SPP and in H. And I want you to basically look at this by an independent variable, which is, which is nominal in nature, which is SPP turtles factor. And we have done that in the past. So I tell uh, Ari here that the data I'm interested in is DF. And I say the functions that I want you to use is again, the C, the concatenate, there's like telling R, there's like more coming than just one thing, is mean standard deviation min and max. That's how you would need to interpret these uh, line 10 and line 11. So, and now I want to stratify any questions with that. I think it's considerably intuitive, right? I hope that my explanations have somewhat helped here. Um, okay, so line 14 to 19, that's creating now something new. So we are doing now something which likely, if, if you're looking at various parameters in your final report data frame, this will be helpful because that is now how, to, how you individually create categories not just turtles, not just equally uh, distributed, but you are now creating individualized groups that have subjects or data entries within a certain boundary contained or within certain boundaries contained. So I'm interested now in three different groups. I'm interested in those that are younger than 35. I'm interested in those that are between 35 and 65 and those that are older than 65. Good. The way I'm doing this is in line 15, 14. And again, at this point, I wanna make a parenthesis because what I'm using here is, is this is raw base R. So there are different ways how you can analyze that. There are packages that are making our more fancy and easier digestible. So if you want to use different packages or you down the road are getting exposed to different packages, I'm showing you the simplest R programming possible. And I do this by intention because I believe in this being the basis of it. Okay, but if you go on line 14, we basically have age category, we're creating an age category that is just NA, it's just missing values all the way through. Now we're creating age category for those with the age smaller than 35, we're assigning a one. For those that are 35, so greater equal 35, and this is indicated with an ampersand, smaller equals 65. Exactly, you create those two boundaries. So you see in the first line in line 
15. Line 15, you said everything smaller than 35 is a one. And now in line 16, you're saying 35 and equal to 35 and 65 and equal to 65 is going to be two. Everything greater than 65 becomes three. And now we're just doing the same thing as we did with the turtles. We're saying leverage one, two, three. It's below 35, between 35 and 65, older than 65. And now we have the summaries and that's our distribution. So this is how you can categorize in our, in factors. And that's how you can work with this quite easily. Because once you have this done, Oh, yeah, we, we can do what we did last time. We're doing an ANOVA. We've done that. We know how to interpret this. We know the post hoc test. I'm not going to go through this again. And uh, that's the post hoc. That's the Bonferroni. Now we can compare SPP as per different factors. Again, same story. Uh, we have the ANOVA that is significant between these three groups and uh, in the postdoc test. And now we're getting actually some more words getting really interesting. And we have 30 minutes left. That's good. Good time management today. So now we want to pack this in the contingency table. And that's really that's the beef of this class. This is this is this is really what this class was about. We want a contingency table, right? Whatever that characteristic is that we want to count, we want to create now with turtles for SPP, turtles for age, we want to create this three by three table, right? And R has a wonderful function, which is the table function. And in the table function, all you need to do, you're telling the table function, what do you want to have on your X and what do you want to have in your Y? X is always the first entry, the comma separates X and Y. Second answer is Y. X is basically columns, Y is rows. And if you run this, line 32, and this is why I made a factor out of it, because now that table looks like this. And that's neat, right? Because essentially this is easily to interpret. This is very easily to, uh, Utilize always of a chi squared. Um, and if we can actually, we can do, well, let's see what I have time. So now, if you want to run a chi squared now on this, you can do this quite easily by basically using the chi squared start test function on that table. So you're basically you're taking the table, you run chi squared dot test. And you basically, you get uh, a chi-square test on the table. You have degrees of freedom is four. Why is it four? You have three rows, three columns. The calculation for degrees of freedom of a contingency table in a chi-square test is number of rows minus one multiplied by number of columns minus one. So it's three minus one is two. 3 minus 1 is 2. 2 by 2 is 4. Degrees of freedom of 4. The chi squared, we remember, it's the sum of observed minus expected squared divided by expected. And it's the sum of these six different fields. Adds up to 170.58 on a degree of freedom of 4 is obviously highly significant is a very high chi squared value. So there's substantially different. So there's a significant relationship between, though there's a significant not relationship, association between age and blood pressure, which we're not surprised by, right? It's like you progress into age, there's basically an association with blood pressure, which is true for men. It's not true for women, for example. Uh, with women only after menopause and average, I think it's like 62, 63 years, then basically that association is also apparent. It's not evident in women before their menopause. 
that association doesn't exist. They're more likely to have lower blood pressure. Um, so that's interesting question. Flagging this interesting question for Enhance, but right? just saying. Okay, uh, chi squared. Uh, if you have a chi squared test and you do this test on a table with LS, you basically you can query this whatever this is. So it's like if you have chi squared to test, I can pack this into an object. I can say I make this test. So now basically I have my chi squared packed into test. So this test is now my chi squared test. So every, everything that you're testing, whether it's a t-test, a chi-squared test, a linear regression model, you can pack all of this in an object for you to query at any later point when you're interested in it. You can always query this again. So if I do now, uh, so I can do LS chi-squared test of SPB age. This is contained in my chi-squared test object. So whenever I run a chi-squared, these are the potentially sub objects or contained object in that object of that test that I can query. So I can get uh, the name of the data. I can get the count, the expected count. I can calculate the method. So the method we know, right? We can calculate the observed, which we know. We can get an exact p-value, which we know. We can get the parameters. We can get residuals. Residuals are actually, uh, that's actually the real post hoc test because the residuals essentially, so that's observed, which is the same as our table. That's expected. That's how expected. We basically calculated. Um, you remember we're calculating the probability of this out of the rows, the probability of this out of the marginal totals here, divided by the overall count of all entries. Same thing doesn't go out two by two table in the uh, in the example in the lecture. So this is the expected count. Chi square calculated is the difference between those two squared divided by the expected, and now with residuals. You basically you get adjusted residuals that are basically containing the direction in which your association points. So you see for each individual entry, you see in which direction your observed count actually erred or deviated from your expected count. So you see, for example, that with those that were older than 65, your turtle, that's when you suddenly had a higher count than you actually expected if there were no association. So these residuals basically give you an idea which group actually deviated and was responsible for using a significant association. That's what you see in here. Also interesting, total one and below 35, higher than expected. If it were, if there were no association, those that were young are actually at a higher blood pressure than you would have expected. Also interesting. Could be interesting to compare between men and women, right? Like as we know, it's like uh, younger women tend to have lower blood pressures as compared to men. Um, okay, so these are just the potential avenues that you may pursue. And yeah, I'm, I'm very blood pressure centric. That's probably my line of work, but basically it's, it's, it's just cardiovascular system is just the most fascinating thing ever. Half as fascinating as the kidney, but very fascinating. Okay, and then you can also calculate the relative risk to essentially get an idea in which that risk actually differs. So let's, let's recap how you calculate risk. That's maybe done well with this. So the risk is calculated here. It's um, risk is actually, it's the risk of receiving death penalty uh, as a white defendant is calculated as receiving 
within the group a death penalty divided by the total number of entries in that group. That's your risk for group one. In uh, the group of the black defendant, you basically you have the same way of analyzing this here. 128 divided by the 5,159. So you basically you get two risks. If we want to do this now with our blood pressure in our R example, um, let's do action exercise. We have time just to illustrate this. So we have now, we have uh, total one, total two, and total three. So now we have below 35, below 35, we have between 35 and 65. 65, we have above 65. We have 167, 140, 27, we have 118, 170, we have 45, we have 38, 166, 129. So this is the observed, right? If we were to calculate now, so this is total and total. So this is the sum here. This is the sum here. So if we were to calculate now expected, If we were to calculate expected, we would need to calculate now. Um, this multiplied by this divided by, oh, some of this. And um, this is now this multiplied by this divided by this. So that would be 107, 107.882. As we can see, that's comparable to the expected count. So that's how you would calculate this basically uh, overall. Now we're doing the same thing here. And then this multiplied by this divided by this gets us on that seven. Now this multiplied by this. No, this divided by this. Okay. So now if you lock this cell in, you know how to lock cells in an Excel, right? No? Okay. Let's see you have an example like this here where you basically you completed another row and you want to lock in one reference value. You're doing this with dollar sign. What the dollar sign does is you can, you can shift now. I'm, I'm gonna go here on the uh, right lower part and you can pull this down and it will take the formula and just propagate it all the way down, right? We all know that. Yeah, are we sure we know that? No. Oh, oh, okay. 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 Let's 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 do the following. You know that when you do one, two, and three, and you're just pulling this uh, down, you go to the right corner. You're pulling this down. It will continue the counting, right? You know that. So, no. Now you're spending the the, yeah, yeah, the door, yes. Okay, so you can, if you have a formula like that, where you're calculating 
this multiplied by this divided by this. So if you are now populating the lower rows, you just need to pull that formula down and it will automatically take the, the, the next lower row and it will adjust basically the, the reference values. So the only thing I need to do here, I need to, uh, I need to basically log in the row. I don't know. Uh, actually, I need to log only the row in. So this is, I'm logging in the row, not the, yeah. Okay, I'm logging this in. So if I log in that column and not the row, it will not shift. So with the dollar sign, you can log in those. Um, okay. 158, 67, 158, 66, 158, 66. So this is our completed expected count now. So with the dollar sign, you log in the reference points. Um, I, 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 I can share this, uh, well, you have it on recording. Okay, so you wanna do this now. So now essentially you can calculate now the risk of uh, being in the being um, the risk of having in the risk of being in the highest turtle of blood pressure, highest turtle of blood pressure is this here. This is column three. This is what I'm addressing here. in the lower so i'm basically i'm bulking now the two younger categories and i only focus on the older category so essentially what i do is i'm creating a new table so that's young that's old that's actually not young it's not old but it's basically i do this Ah, oh, that was not good. Equals sum of this. No. Equals sum of this and this and this. So now I can just pull this over, and I have here total one. Total two and total three. No. So I have stratified now in young. I have everybody that's younger than 65 and old are all those older than 65. So now I want to know the risk to be in the highest total when being older than 65. So the only group I'm actually interested in is this one. That is the risk I wanna determine as compared to all the other ones. So now first I need the risk of being in the highest turtle. So that's risk one. The risk of being in the highest turtle is divided by the sum of all, right? I want the risk divided by sum of these three, right? The numerator is this count here. Well, why am I doing it unexpected? I'm supposed to do it on this. Okay. That was on logic, yeah, well, doesn't matter. Okay, let's just for the sake of argument. Okay, 
So I want my, my numerator is now turtle three of the old population. So that's risk one. Uh, so that is P4. That's the turtle three in the respective group divided by the sum of all entries in all three turtles. So that's risk one, which is 0 0.33 because it's the expected count, <laughs> reference to expected count. But doesn't matter. Uh, the, the argument is the same. So risk two, risk two is now turtle three divided by the sum of all entries amongst the young. So that's, mm. yes. So that gives us all the zero point thirty three. Why? Because it's the expected count, right? So what happens now if I calculate the risk ratio? What is to be expected, right? If I have an expected count, if there's no association, that risk ratio needs to be one. And that's exactly what's happening. If I calculate the risk ratio now, is this divided by this, that's logically one. Good, simple, there's a no-brainer. But if we do the same exercise now on our actual data, and we're just copying this whole structure over there, with one entry. Oops, a little bit too much. Ah. Okay, need more space. Okay, just a second. Okay, need more space. Uh, this Croatia, we're doing this, this, this. Okay, now we're doing the same on the observed. Now we're calculating here. Uh, so it's basically a, a copied over the entire table. It's the same calculation. We have now young and old. So young is now uh, these two. Young total two is these two. Young total three is these three, two. Uh, old is that. Old second total is this. Third total is this. Now we're calculating risk one. So risk one in our observed count is now you have a risk of 25% to be in the highest total of blood pressure if you're younger than 65. Once you are in the age group of older than 65, your risk increases to 65%. So if I calculate now a risk ratio, and I calculate uh, M4 over M3, the risk of being in the higher blood pressure turtle is 2.5 times the risk of somebody who is younger than 65. That is the interpretation of this risk ratio. Makes sense, right? It's a pretty, pretty useful way to look at data, right? And well, flagging this for the fun project is a good way to look at it. Okay, so we are doing the same story now here in R, uh, same thing. So you calculate the sum of those. So SPPH, let's display the data frame. Ah, we have it. Um, okay, let's do observed. Casper observed. That's our data frame. Keep in mind when you when you're looking at these cells, this is one one, this is two one, this is three one, this is two two and uh, two one, and uh, no, this is uh, one two, this is two two, this is three two. So you basically you have row, comma, column, row one two three, column one two three, one one. Three, three. So you're basically following along with the outline row, comma, column. Good. So you want now the sum of SPPH one column two, which is 
this and this. Column three, which is this. That's turtle three. Uh, that's turtle three. So that's the risk. That's the numerator is those that are younger than 65 in turtle three. So that's these two entries divided by the sum of SPPH one to two, which is the first two columns of one to three of all three columns. So that's the sum of all in those respective two categories. So now calculating this through gives us a risk of 25%, which is the same risk that we've determined in Excel. Good, so we get this. So now risk of old is SPPH of 3, 3, which is this one, divided by the sum of SPPH, row 3, 1, 2, 3, is the sum of all these three. Gives us an age of 0 0.64. Now calculating the relative risk is risk of old over risk of young gives us here a relative risk of 2.51. The same value as we have determined in Excel. So I will post this Excel spreadsheet that you can review this and the calculations in Excel is maybe a little bit easier digestible than R, but basically this is how you get and build the bridges. And this is how you calculate the respective group risks. And you can relate this group risks to each other by uh, determining your risk ratio. Good. All right, have fun with Created Lab 3. It's going to be going in the same direction. Please study this code. This may be very, very helpful for the final project because you, you, you may go down this pathway to kind of quantify things like that. All right, any questions on anything? Okay, I see you on Saturday at 3. I encourage you to join. Uh, it's not going to be a review session in the classical sense that I'm reviewing things. It's I'm I'm there for you. I will stay if none of you joins. I will stay on for an hour, and I will I will wait if somebody can join. Um, I want to hear your problems. I want to hear your ideas. I want to hear your thoughts. It's like we can review things. We can review your work. We can review your code. It's like whatever I can, whatever I can help you with. Uh, let's do it on Saturday. Okay. No, absolutely not. Uh, I'm, 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 it's, it, it, I just can't. <laughs> hmm? Sunday. Saturday at three. Yeah. I can, Sunday. What time? Is there a general consensus Sunday is better? No. Hmm? no. no. Yeah, I, I only can do one. I can record the session. Um, Saturday earlier, Bella. Saturday earlier, Bella. I'm, I'm somewhat flexible. I have to run 16 miles. That's, that's my only. Hmm? There will be a recording. I'm going to record this. One. Yeah, maybe if you guys are connected with WhatsApp somehow, uh, send each other questions. Send me, uh, you can also send me, or you can post on the discussion board. I actually, we can also do it like that. I go through the discussion board and you post screenshots. Do screenshots. Please don't send me codes. Uh, that becomes a little bit complicated. Um, Although it's doable to some extent, but okay, sounds good. Any questions on Zoom? Yeah, let's say we'll set up this real quick, please. All right, if no questions, then we can conclude for today. So thank you on Zoom. See you on Saturday. Hope you can join and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.